Remember, the time you feel lonely is the time you most need to be by yourself. Life's cruelest irony. Why do we smile at the end of Midsommar? The movie follows a grief-stricken and lonely young woman named Danny as she goes from being horrified by the Hargas's violent traditions to actively taking part in them as we, the audience, cheer her on. It's a fairy tale where at some point the big bad wolf convinces Little Red Riding Hood and us that happily ever after can be found in his teeth. I've heard people call this movie a dark fairy tale, folk horror, and an operatic breakup movie. But this is also a story about indoctrination, the slow surrender of individual identity to the crushing embrace of the collective. So why were so many people empowered by it? That warm feeling the ending gives us makes me think that not only have the Hargas successfully brainwashed Danny, but writer-director Ari Aster has successfully brainwashed many of us. Welcome to Acolytes of Horror, where we examine the horrors of life through the horrors of film. And tonight I'm scared of Midsommar and brainwashing. A lot of fans and critics talk about the end of this movie as if it's a victory for Danny. The film's final act is about the release Danny finds in not diminishing herself. Gone is the woman who has decided to conceal her emotions for the sake of sparing others. Digging deeper, this is a story about the importance of empathy, shared emotion, and finding family in the most unexpected places. Danny may have lost her biological family, but she's gained the understanding that a family can be chosen. That smile symbolized finding joy again after so much pain. Even if that joy was brought about by something awful, it feels like a new beginning for Danny. She's free from her bad relationship free from her guilt, and free from her isolation. While Harga may not be an ethical place, it is the right place for Danny to finally find peace. The end of Midsommar shows that this has Midsommar. been a fairy tale all that along. Immensely satisfying all I have ending. to say to it's Christian funny. is, burn, baby, burn! Yes, Midsommar. Also, my entire I feel held by Pele. Happy. I joined the cult in Midsommar. They seem fun. So, I think this might be a happy ending. What do you... <laughs> And I'm curious what, what your response is to that. Um, well, um, it is, I don't know. To be fair, if you look at the story structure of this thing, her boyfriend Christian is the main antagonist and Danny does defeat him. He spends the entire movie gaslighting her into apologizing every time she's upset that he's ignoring her, and at the end, she finds a new family and gets to stand up for her own feelings. She burns Christian and her own emotional isolation to the ground. But also, by the end of this movie, Danny is cut off from both society and reality, at the mercy of a group of people who killed everyone she came with. It's implied that they might let her join them. You are the family now, yes? But it's perfectly plausible to assume that they might still kill her. And yet, she smiles and we smile. It's an uplifting feeling at the time because of a series of brainwashing techniques that predatory groups like the Harga have honed to perfection for decades. Cults hide their horror in the daylight and use worship and ritual as a form of psychic bombardment. And I think it's really interesting that not only do the Harga use those same techniques on Danny, but the movie uses those techniques on us. And that's what this video is about. But before we get to that, Danny's journey begins the same place every brainwashing story does. Loneliness. Danny cries a lot in this movie. She's barely begun to process the horrific murder-suicide that killed her entire family in a single night. 
Even the mention of the word family is enough to make her fall to pieces. You guys are like my family. You're like my real, actual family. Danny cries a lot, and she always cries alone. She's always running to a private place where nobody else has to see her feelings, which Christian encourages. I'm gonna go. Just take some time yourself, okay? Depression has a way of keeping you alone, which has a way of keeping you depressed. When you're depressed, your body feels heavy. The air itself has this crushing weight. So it's a comment on how lonely Danny must be, or maybe how strong she is, that she's still trying to go out to parties and Swedish summer trips. She's doing the number one thing that they say you should do when dealing with trauma. Don't isolate yourself. The problem is, Christian seems to be the only person she has left, and he isolates her at every turn. Where are you going? I was just gonna go to that party for 45 minutes, but you just keep sleeping. Oh, no, I'll come with you. You sure you've had enough sleep? He's completely checked out of this relationship, but some combination of pity and apathy keep him from breaking up with her. Every time Danny picks up on this, he makes her feel like she's being crazy. When she finds out that Christian is planning on taking a trip to Sweden in a few weeks and he's told her nothing about it, Danny so quickly cedes the moral high ground of why didn't you tell me to achieve a much smaller, sadder goal. She just wants him to finish the conversation. Maybe I should just go home. What? No, no. I'm just trying to understand. Christian does win this fight, but he's digging his own grave here. Not just because he's pushing Danny away, but because he's teaching her to ignore her own feelings and fears. Later on, he'll be the one telling her not to judge the Harga after witnessing the grisly Atastupa ceremony. That was really, really shocking. I'm trying to keep an open mind, though. When the Harga brainwash Danny into going along with the ritualized human sacrifice of Christian, they're really just finishing what he started. I'm trying to keep an open mind, though. Her brain is absolutely melting with loneliness, which makes her a classic target for brainwashing. Real-world cults are filled with lonely people desperate for belonging. Harvard professor of psychiatry, Dr. John G. Clark Jr. writes, Cult recruiters frequent bus stations, airports, campuses, libraries, rallies, anywhere that unattached persons are likely to be passing through. Because loneliness makes us malleable. It makes us reach outside of ourselves to find anywhere that we might belong. Cults are so persuasive because they find these lonely people and they say, Hey, come join our family, and you'll never feel lonely again. He's my good friend, and I like him, but... Danny, do you feel held by him? Does he feel like home to you? I think about this moment between Pele and Danny a lot. Pele is one of the biggest reasons that the Harga win over so many of us in the audience at the end of this movie. Even on my third viewing, Knowing what I know, he knows. I can't help but love the guy. Christian doesn't make eye contact with Danny. Pele stares at her as if she's the only person in the world. Conversations with Christian are terse and evasive. Pele asks Danny questions and seems genuinely interested in having deeper conversations. Christian represses. Pele wants her to open up. And after sitting through just one hour at this point of Danny's nightmare of isolation, all this talk of finally feeling held is already starting to sound like a happy ending. Audiences in 2019 might have been especially vulnerable to this suggestion. This might be the loneliest generation in modern history. Technology has made isolation much easier, which can make meaningful social connection feel a lot harder. And that was before we were all under quarantine. But let's interrogate this scene a little bit more critically. This conversation happens right after Danny has witnessed a grisly ritualized suicide. She's seen people's faces and legs literally explode. So she's ready to pack up and get the hell out of there. Suddenly, Pele shows up to calm her down and tell her that her feelings are wrong. When she tries to talk about the violence she just witnessed, Pele pivots the conversation back around to her loneliness. 
Okay, okay, but I'm not an anthropologist and I don't understand any of this. Yes, yes, I yes, get... I know, I know. And, and yet I was the most excited for you to come because I lost my parents too. What? No, no, yes, Pele, yes, that yes. is not what I'm talking about. But I know what it's like because I do, I really, really do. <laughs> yet my difference is I never got the chance to feel lost because I had a family. It's easy to just melt into the warmth of Pele's concern here, but... In this moment, is he being a good friend or a good salesman? What poetry that it's now the hottest and brightest summer on record. Is it tomorrow? I mean, from yesterday's perspective. <laughs> There's an old children's story where the sun and the wind make a bet to see who can make a passing traveler shed his coat the fastest. The harder the wind blows, the tighter the traveler clutches his coat. But when the sun shines, he takes it off willingly. It's hardwired right into our bodies. The cold and the dark is dangerous. The sun is safe. Yet at the same time, we know we're watching a horror movie. We're suspicious of the Harga from the beginning. But everything is so beautiful and the Harga are so nice that the effort of staying scared of them for two and a half hours starts to wear on us. Welcome, 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 Thank welcome. Yeah. Movies like The Wicker Man or The Texas Chainsaw Massacre have experimented with daylight horror before, but Midsommar is the master of brightness. The color white is just everywhere. Everyone wears white. It's always daytime. The Atastupa scene is color corrected to be so blindingly bright it's barely one step removed from a scene out of THX 1138. It makes the Harga feel pure and heavenly, but it's a blinding white, like looking directly into the sun. As the Harga's savagery against Christian and his friends intensifies, so too does their kindness to Danny. When the Harga's plot is revealed, when we realize that they're killing the guy we hate and welcoming the girl we most empathize with, there's this profound relief we get from just letting go and drifting along the current of sunshine. Once she's chosen as May Queen, Danny becomes the center of attention, and Christian's the one who is ignored. They lift her up, they smile and laugh at her like she's a new baby. A woman who escaped a doomsday cult called the Worldwide Church of God wrote afterwards that The indoctrination process was the best part of being in the group. New people were invited to dinner, quizzed intensely about their past, offered home-cooked meals and support around the home, had their dance card filled with happy social events, love-bombed. Niceness let the barriers down. It also stopped the appropriate boundaries from being in place whenever members felt uncomfortable but that seemed a small price to pay to fit in. In a dog-eat-dog -dog world, who doesn't want to be part of an intoxicatingly nice community? What's that? That's not for us. This intoxicatingly nice community never does anything to hurt Danny. The finishing blow that finally sends Danny into their loving embrace only comes when she disobeys them. Never mind how the Harga drugged and coerced Christian into taking part in this orgy to begin with. Never mind that they surely had to know how much noise they were making when Danny's chariot rolled past. Don't think about how exhaustively choreographed this moment must have been, how much planning had to have gone into it. It's hard to think about things like that, about such nice people on such a bright, hot day. What matters is that Danny has finally found a place where she can feel held, right? A place where she can cry right out in the open, under the sun. Brainwashing is really just a matter of mental exhaustion. So you can't brainwash somebody with kindness alone. That's why cults constantly keep their members stressed and tired. More and more of their time and money are demanded. Sometimes they are physically or sexually abused. And if you ask any questions, oh, wow, maybe you aren't as pure as the rest of us. Maybe we should kick you out. It's why doomsday preachers are 
always thinking up new dates for the apocalypse. It's why alt-right figureheads are always trying to scare the hell out of their listeners. We can't make healthy decisions for ourselves when we're scared and confused all the time. The brain literally can't handle it. I love the way this movie uses our fear of the Harga to make us more familiar with them. The more it jostles us, the more obsessively we watch them. Ari Aster gives us plenty of time to dread and puzzle over every bad omen. His camera floats rather than shocks. A jump scare can make you raise your guard for one surprising moment, but instead he calmly sprinkles in these ominous warnings that make you raise your guard through the whole movie, even when nothing bloody is happening. My favorite example of this is the first appearance of the deformed oracle. The camera cuts to him in the middle of an otherwise normal scene, lingers on him for a while, and then cuts back away, not to be mentioned again for the rest of the scene. At this point in the movie, we have no idea who this is, or even where he is in relation to everybody else. On its own, he isn't the scariest thing in the world, but he's jammed into this less threatening moment, so now my fear of the Oracle trickles into the rest of this otherwise harmless scene. It's like one of those nightmares where you know something bad is in the next room, but you watch your hand slowly twist the doorknob anyway. Fatigue becomes surrender, which really mimics the way a lot of cults and other predatory groups treat their members. You know, they're under constant threat of being kicked out of the community for the most trivial of reasons. They're worked impossibly long hours and kept in these long, group-intensive chanting and other rituals. And anything, you know, to give them a more immediate task to worry about so their brain doesn't have the stamina left to worry or question about their leader's motives. They, all they have strength left to do is to just collapse into the arms of their community, even as that community slowly squeezes the breath out of their lungs. I'm reminded of one of the key insights from Daniel Kahneman's seminal psychology book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which asserts that when faced with a difficult question, we often answer an easier one instead, usually without noticing the substitution. So we're just going to ignore the bed. It's a bear. Oh, thanks. Instead of answering Simon's actual question, why is there a bear here? Ingmar answers an easier question for him. What is that? It's a bear. All these stressful moments amount to little questions being planted in the audience's brain. Questions which start getting answers all in a row, right as Danny starts giving in to the Harga. Immediately after she hits her breaking point, the movie gives us answers on what happened to Simon, Connie, Mark, and Josh, one right after the other. It's a narrative reward for wrestling with this anxiety for so long, giving us this jackpot of dopamine right before Danny's big final smile. By relieving this stress right at the climax, the movie lets us ignore the difficult question of what's going to happen to Danny to focus instead on an easier question. What happened to everyone else? It's a question we're more than happy to go along with, especially after the hour-long psychedelic finale where all the stressful imagery ramps up to a fever pitch. Uh-oh. Oh, God. Here we go! <laughs> I haven't explicitly referred to the Harga as a cult, but I have been comparing them to cults a lot, and Maybe that hasn't been entirely fair. I mean, the differences between a cult and a religion and even some corporate environments can be so slight that most religious scholars don't even use the word cult. They <laughs> actually have this nerdy little joke that goes, cult plus time equals religion. I bring this up because the thing that gets Danny to open up to the Harka isn't just the hallucinogens. She tries shrooms earlier in the film and runs away. 
Danny changes because the Harga invite her to worship with them. I think many of us hear the word worship and we think of a stuffy Baptist chapel, sparsely attended by old people, mumbling the lyrics of some ancient hymnal at the sleepiest possible tempo. But worship can be a pulse-pounding experience. I'll never forget going to the CIY or Christ in Youth conference in high school. It was a week-long summer convention where a bunch of high school youth groups got together from a bunch of different churches for some non-stop God time. It's a packed schedule of worship, sermons, games, and devotionals. Every evening always ended in this gigantic auditorium packed with thousands of teens and pastors. Bros with electric guitars led worship that blasted out of giant speakers, only stopping long enough for a sermon or two. Every service ended with an altar call, and every night, swarms of crying teenagers would run to the front for God to save them. By the end of the week, it was a full-on stampede. Everyone ran up there. I ran up there because I felt so connected. You know, I, I was never more positive that God was tangibly real, like I could touch Him real, than when I was being absorbed into this larger celebration. What's weird about that was I'd already been saved before. <laughs> Growing up, I must have been saved over a dozen times, almost always at the end of one of these week-long trips. Just being in the emotion of that moment of worship, feeling the purity of that spiritual experience after hearing all these sermons about sin and salvation and doing all these group activities from 6.30 a.m. to 11 p.m. for five days in a row, I just surrendered. You know, just like Danny at the end of this movie, it felt great. You know, it was a catharsis. It just didn't last very long. You know, you could always tell in my church when it was the Sunday morning after CIY because <laughs> The youth section was full of upraised hands and loud, confident singing. And then the next week, just seven days later, everyone was sleepy and on their phones again. And that's why people in cults are so keen to separate their targets from the rest of the world, why they pack their schedules so full of all these intense group-centered activities. And I don't mean to say that church is bad or that the people who run CIY are death cults. I made a lot of great friends at CIY because when you worship with someone, you attach yourself to them. And that's the whole point I guess I'm trying to make here. Worship is an act of vulnerability, not just to God, but to everyone you're worshiping with. So far more important than any labels of church or cult is whether that vulnerability is respected or exploited. The power of ritual on the human mind is undeniable. People call Midsommar a movie about an evil cult, but the Harga seem to be free to go out into the world. There's no central figure manipulating everyone for his own private personal gain the power dynamics actually appear to be tranquil. This isn't a cult, it's just a culture. And the evils of a culture are a lot harder to talk about because they don't always look like evil. The Harga aren't monsters twisted by rage or bloodlust like we're used to seeing in horror movies. They're happy, they're nice. They just kill because killing is how they worship. It makes me wonder what kind of fears are rotting at the core of all the smiles and rituals in my life. How is my culture exploiting my loneliness? How is my culture kind to me? How does my culture stress me out? What does it want me to worship and what kind of difficult questions does it want me to ignore? At the end of the movie, Danny isn't crying alone anymore. She's crying out in public, and there's something lovely about that, but, you know, she's not fixed. She's still crying. When I see her lurching around, engulfed in flowers, she looks like a monster. Beautiful, but completely consumed. This is a moment of legitimate healing, don't get me wrong. 
dangerous communities like the Harga can help people process their feelings. That's part of their whole appeal. But they turn them into something else in the process. These girls aren't really feeling Danny or Christian's pain. They're just performing it. This genuinely therapeutic catharsis has been manufactured by people who now own her life. When you're broken, how do you want to be put back together? Stronger or weaker? Sometimes you need to cry with someone, but it's okay to cry alone too. Sometimes that's what you need most of all. Because if you just go from one codependent relationship to another, you'll be too tired to ask any questions when they say, take from the yew tree, feel no pain. Maybe they'll be telling you the truth. Maybe it'll be fine. Or maybe you'll find out you've been lied to at the very worst possible moment. Hey, wow, thank you so much for watching my entire video. I love this movie, I love talking about this movie, and there's going to be a lot more horror deep dives in the future. So if you like what you saw and you want to see more, this is the first of many. So be sure to subscribe. You know, this is really just a passion project of mine. I'm, so, you know, any encouragement you might want to throw my way in the comments or on Twitter, are just so inspiring and so motivating. You really have no idea how big of an impact a few kind words can have on a small creator like me. And if you really like what I'm doing and you want to help out with a donation by clicking on that link in the video's description, mm, that would be amazing. I'm debating on covering either The Lighthouse or Annihilation next time. So be on the lookout for that. And until then, remember, the monsters on the screen aren't nearly as wild as the monster behind your eyes. So let the wild rumpus begin. See you next time.